Good evening to everyone present here with us today. This is Sreon from IGCP, today's moderator. I would like to welcome all the viewers who have joined our platform for better exchange of knowledge that is going to be shared by your keynote speaker doctor for today's session. With much pleasure and honor, I would like to welcome a very renowned professor, Dr. J. A. Jayalal. Sir is MS, DLS, FIAGES, FMAS, FICS, FACS USA, MBA, FIIOPM, DLS Germany, PhD Surgery, FRCS UK, PG Teacher, Professor and HOD of Surgery at Kanya uh, Kumari Medical College. With the help of Sir and his wonderful insight, we will be taking a close look on today's topic, which is Ethical and Legal Consideration in Invasive Surgeries. Now, without any further delay, I would like to welcome Sir at our forum and would like to hand over the session to him. Over to you, Sir. Yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity to be with you at this moment. Uh, first of all, I must thank the IJCP for inviting me to be with you and uh, ha have this wonderful opportunity of sharing some uh, input and knowledge uh, on the ethical concern and the legal uh, concern, uh, depending upon that, how much uh, we are able to talk to you today. Legal and ethical issues of the surgery is the most important word which uh, we are going to discuss today. Uh, many times you have talked on the legal issues. So uh, today my more concentration I will be putting on the ethical concerns and what we are uh, going to have the challenges of ethics in the uh, surgical practice. Uh, ethics is a word derived from ethos, which means the character. So it is not only that uh, how competently one person is doing a surgery, but what is his character? What is his impact on the human being when he is operating? What are the uh, norms and means by which he will be able to uh, adopt in the surgical practice is what is the main concern is. It is a moral principle. That is, it is more than the science. It is the how, as a human being, the surgeon is having the uh, moral principles or the values which he is having and which is when he is performing the art of surgery, how it is going to uh, take into that. We know medicine is not a pure science, like what we talk about the Bachelor of Science. Medicine is not a pure science. It is an art. An art is what we, we come by practice, whether it is uh, playing cricket or putting a dance. It is uh, more than the scientific part of it. It is the how one is going to perform it is most important. So this art part of the medicine as a profession needs ethical consideration, that is the values, principles, and ethos, which are going to decide on that principle. Generally, we're talking about the medical ethics and surgical ethics. In general, they look same, but surgical ethics goes a little more beyond that. It is not only just the procedure, it is the uh, impact which you are going to create on the person, it is impact we are going to create on the family, impact of uh, recovery, which you are facilitating, and the confidence which we are creating in this space, all this is uh, playing a major uh, role. It is uh, more important is a person. When we say surgery, is uh, it is an uh, art of putting in uh, hands working on. All the, uh, the lot of definition, I am not going to the details of that, but all of the science in the world cannot make an accomplished surgeon. It is the doing and it, it makes a consecrate out. Or it is not the uh, just uh, knowledge or the uh, cognitive skill on the surgeon is going to translate into the effect into the human being. Something more than that. It is that ethical principle, ethical values. So a surgeon is not only made by his science. Maybe he is a medalist. He scored uh, I mean highest mark in the uh, exam. But that will not make him as a good surgeon. A good surgeon is someone who is different who will be make an impact in the society. So that I just put it all that to just to make an impact. So that we normally say uh, a surgeon must have uh, a communication skills. He must have a gut feeling with which he is going to operate. The ethics comes from the heart and which lead to that. The science, of course, it is the brain which is going to think of that. And he must also have the legal validity. So you are not only a professionally competent, you are not only socially relevant, you are not only going to be the medically 
medical legally upright, but also you must be ethically a standardized person, ethically upgraded person to make an impact in the surgical practice which you know. So in, in surgery, there is a lot of uh, studies has done and which is going to be helpful for that. Ethics has a lot of history. Uh, it, it, it is not a, what is we are getting only in today. Way back, even in the olden era of uh, 600 BC, it has a value because it is all came from the people who were practicing the great art of surgery and uh, put forward that the surgeon has to have some ethical principles. Surgeon must have ethical values. Starting from uh, this uh, Charak Samhida, uh, it, it is mounting, lasting back, back to the 600 BC. And it talks about a lot of things. And after that, we had a Hippocratic Oath. It was only a 400 BC. So Sarak Samhida was the oldest one. And later we had a, a Hippocratic Oath. But fortunately, the Hippocratic Oath had gone into a lot of metamorphosis. What it was there on the 400 BC has been metamorphosis to the current day. It was a dynamic one. Very lately, it has come, even by the now 2022, the Virgin Medical Council Association has converted that. A lot of trial, Nazi doctors and those Nuremberg trial, and many things has helped in that. Finally, the UNESCO, the world the UNESCO uh, has come out at the Universal Declaration of Bioethics. All that is going to talk about this itch. Why we need to talk about that? Because it, it is not like a, a science where it is black and white. What we are going to say is a right for one individual may not be right for other. It is a, a, a art part the compassion part, the, the, the intricacy, the, the relationship which we are building part, all that is going to God. The lot of values, the difference will be there, and that is what we are going to talk. I think I have shown you a picture here, and uh, which if you look, uh, it, it has a lot of uh, hidden pictures are inside. So ethics also, it is something is explicitly seen outside. It is also something which is hidden. It is uh, something which is innate, which is, comes with the integrity, the humanity, values of the person. So all that is very important that, that uh, it, it can pursue, it can give a different perception, but we need to do. And uh, if you see, just see. Can you find the mistake? Where's the mistake? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Can you find the mistake? No, can, can you, you see there's mistake? a mistake here? Where's the mistake? And, uh, as the question was asked, immediately we look into the one, two, three, four, one, five, two, six, three, seven, eight, four, Absolutely looks five, fine. Six, seven, eight, for a, for nine, a eyes, it's a scientific term. Can you but find the, the if you look mistake? actual mistake, it is good as two D. One, two, three, so I just three, put this three, just to four, say five. ethics is something beyond what we perceive. Something is something beyond what we comprehend. Ethics is something which is uh, is a more of integral part which we need to bring in. So this change of ethics definitely we need to adopt as a surgeon. If you want to be a subject, successful surgeon, it is not only your uh, your scientific knowledge. I also also want to bring to you a kind notice. There is a one uh, article very recently published in a, a journal, which a surgeon has said. Uh, he has done thyroidectomy uh, surgery through his scope. He has passed through the anal canal. So he has put a scope through the anal canal, came to the all the way through the intestines, crossed it, came to the oral cavity, I mean uh, stomach, came to the oral cavity, put a, a score, so, uh, that small scar there, and brought out and done a uh, thyroid surgery. And at the end, there was no scar in the neck. Through the anal canal, the surgeon was able to remove the thyroid. But read this statement. The surgery did approximately 22 hours to perform. The neck is contaminated with fecal matter. We caused a perforation or two in the bowel, which needed an ex exploratory laparotomy. But it was all worth to avoid that neck incision. This is a statement by the surgeon who has done that. He is technically, he is right. He has done a, a, a procedure, but can we say he is ethically right? Can we say that uh, this is going to be a beneficial to the patient which he has operated? It may add to his name, say that he is a Herculean surgeon or he is a, a surgeon of great uh, caliber, but it doesn't going to give any big change in the patient. So this is where 
the ethical principles and ethical values has to come. And we also come across a situation where a patient is going to come to you with a, a disease, which is incurable disease, and whether we wanted to say whether, whether I need to uh, tell you to the patient or the patient, the relatives will say, don't tell you to the patient. In both the way, it is right. But the surgeon has to put extraordinary his uh, effort, his understanding, his holistic approach in understanding the situation and put it to beneficial to the patient of that. There are different situations we can go on adding to that. There's a lot of difference between law, legal and ethics. Legal is always black and white. When you make a mistake, you will be punishable in the legal. And uh, law says, and this should be done, this should not be done. So it is after you doing that act, it is punishable. But ethics, Immanuel Kant, one of the leading psychiatrists, he says, even the thought of it, even uh, 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 just uh, imagine when you're thinking that I am going to do this, I am going to do this, and shall I do this? Even if you say, it about the small kind of act, even the, uh, you are guilty if you, the thought of that is going to come. So there's two components, medical, legal, and ethical are the two uh, important kinds in a surgical uh, setup a surgeon will face. There are a lot of works which is ethically right, but uh, they are not legally upright. Even if a patient come with a severe pain and agony and she was uh, being raped, and she is pregnant with a boy and coming at the level of 27 weeks or 28 weeks, it is legally not right to do an MTP. But if the surgeon says that I know the agony of the patient, I understand, I have done a counseling, in spite of that, the patient is not able to conceive and she is going to face a lot of problem. And he may be ethically right to perform that function, but not legally, he is wrong. Similarly, certain things, something like that, legally it is right. It, it may be uh, ethically and your moral or your personal belief may not allow. Same way, Jagoba witness patient, when he comes for a, a blood transfusion, he will, he will say, I do not want. A surgeon cannot say, no, it is necessary, I will put. Even if you put a blood, legally you may be right. Nobody can punish you. But ethically, and we are not respecting the patient, that is wrong. So there are... These two, medical, legal and ethical, are the two sides of a coin which a surgeon has to embark whenever he is going to a practice or There are various events which are ethically right but legally wrong. There are events which are legally right and legally and ethically right and we need to do. To understand this ethical, there are certain principles or put forward. They are the foundation or the fundamental, the pillars of ethical. When you talk about ethics, and what they consider, what are the, what are the paramount important uh, pitches which gives an ethical? The uh, first is uh, beneficence, second one is a uh, non maleficence third, autonomy, fourth, justice. These four are primary pillars. And I, I will be I'll be happy at the end of this uh, lecture when you are listening to this topic, these four words which is going to embark in you throughout your life career, throughout your activities, and whatever you are going to do for a patient, whatever surgical you are going to do. And these four are the primary thong, the autonomy, beneficence, moral efficiency, and justice. Of course, the dignity and truthfulness are these. We put it in a different way. The four pillars are autonomy, beneficence, non maleficence and justice. And dignity and honesty, and the person should have the honesty, the surgeon must have the honesty, and surgeon must have the dignified behavior, and this constitutes an ethical. We will go a little more detail on that, and what is this autonomy, and what is this beneficial. One example I want to say, a patient, X, and previous slide, we can see, what is autonomy? It is respecting the values of the patient, what the patient believes, and what the patient expects, or what the patient wants, and giving priority, to the concerns of the patient is autonomy. Beneficence is the word which denotes and whatever you do, it is always for the good. And if it is going to produce a harm and you will not do, that comes as a non-maleficence. Do no harm. Maleficence is whatever the procedure, whatever, like what an example which I showed earlier. When we when you are trying to do a scarless thyroidectomy, you are creating exploratory laparotomy, fecal contamination. So that all going to add to the complication of the patient. So that the surgeon should never do uh, any harm to the patient, especially with the innovative surgery and invasive surgery is coming out. A lot of attractive new marketing things are coming out. 
and when you are going to do it's a non maleficence and that is most important justice with your limited resources and limited opportunities and limited facilities and what best you are going to do. so these are the four cardinal principles let us see one case and an example of this this patient had come up with a huge retroperitoneal mass in the abdomen and uh, this ct shows that the mass is impinging up the ureter because of this impinging on the ureter and producing obstruction to the ureter the person is going towards the renal failure and the surgeon has seen there is a mass and he know for sure and this is relatively a benign mass so if you remove that mass if you can do a surgery this mass can be removed so that will be uh, remove the obstruction in the ureter thereby the patient can recover if you are then this is a proposal which the surgeon has told the patient but patient says i do not want to have a surgery i am totally afraid of any injection i am totally afraid of anesthesia i cannot uh, uh, undergo a surgery this is a statement now the surgeon is in a dilemma whether he can go against the will of the patient if he is not doing a surgery at this moment this patient will continue to suffer with the renal failure so that he need to put the patient on a dialysis machine so thereby he is denying an opportunity for an another deserving patient to get the uh, dialysis the, the hospital has only few dialysis machine if there is another patient is coming with an acute renal failure and he will not be able to use that dialysis machine for that but this patient his situation it is a, a remediable surgically do but he is not doing but as a against the will of the patient as the patient is not interested for the surgery patient cannot the doctor surgeon cannot go forward with the surgery so that is an autonomy principle of that though it is a surgery is the best way patient is not willing he cannot leave the patient he cannot say that uh, you are not willing for surgery so i will not do anything we will just go but he needs to find out uh, some ways to protect that's the only way is putting the patient for a for a uh, uh, in a dialysis and unless he is putting for that if she is refusing for the surgery he needs to put on the dialysis and which is going to prevent and another people who are coming for a need for a dialysis they are not going to get and the surgeon is having a ethical concern i am doing a justice for that because the limited uh, amen i need to give for this patient so that another patient i am avoiding or i am denying the opportunity so these are the few these are the four cardinal principle which we always look upon whenever you are deciding on that uh, the autonomy so little more details on autonomy autonomy is what the patient has to do when you are talking with the patient when the patient is uh, right from the choosing your patient choosing the doctor it is a the, the a patient has the priority prerogative to come and obtain suppose he is coming in a medical college you as a uh, chief and the patient with the belief is coming to you and that you will be operating and if you ask your uh, house surgeon or intern the junior most person to operate the surgeon the patient has the right to say no patient has a right to say that only i came for only you to operate and you cannot take it granted that i come that anyone can operate so right from the choosing the patient right from the uh, uh, choosing the way where what kind of treatment he is undergoing what kind of uh, remedial step post operative care whether it is radiotherapy whether it is a chemotherapy whether it is a hormonal therapy what he can have and say never ever take a decision for the patient it is only that surgeon can empower the patient surgeon can give the options to the patient different views to the patient but the ultimate decision of the treatment choice of procedure this is of how he is going to get it done all that has to be made by the patient so for for any any for any body even if you are in the top position never ever take a decision for a clinical procedure to be adopted or a surgical procedure to be done for a patient on you so that adopt the autonomy and uh, whether i am talking of the competence whether you are going to say the the, the other components when we are talking about autonomy getting a consent how you are going to get a consent are you going to give all the details about the surgery complications of the uh, uh, surgical procedure explaining everything to him and making the patient to take a choice and or you are going to withholding few important complication and putting the patient or coercing the patient to take a decision that is against the principle of autonomy so we need to put everything in front of the patient and we also has to give the importance about the the cultural and the belief of the patient like what i told earlier if the patient is a jagova witness and if he is refusing to, to say the blood transfusion 
and we need to respect their culture and we need to respect the behavior we cannot act like a paternal person i am saying so you need to obey and that cannot be the feature of the autonomy that every time that you need to get to the value of the patient and in all that things this autonomy plays a major role and it everything and respecting the individual as a whole and his uh, his uh, problems that so the second component beneficence which we had told the earlier it is uh, whether you are competent enough to do the procedure maybe the laparoscopy surgery has come it is a good procedure good choice but if the surgeon if you are saying that you are not competent enough or uh, how you are going to face the situation so whatever you are doing and it has to be beneficence and non maleficence is doing no harm there is a big saying in surgery a good surgeon knows how to operate a better surgeon knows when to operate a best surgeon knows when not to operate a good surgeon is what it is he, he must be able to know, take a decision that by doing this it is not going to but uh, advantage the harms are going to be more than we you need to refrain from doing the surgery so that is what we are going to do and do no harm is a principle whether it is a research you are doing whether it is a study you are making in all that you need to do or when 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 we we, we need to be extremely cautious and this comes under the mal practice also comes under the part of the ethical concern of a do no harm when you do a surgery and if you are keeping a foreign body inside keeping your gas inside all that is going to create a uh, in a, in a, a complication to the patient so in in all our action in whatever you do whether it is a communication whether it is a documentation or documenting action of the communication which you are making communication of the document which you are making and also the preservation of the document so there is a legal requirement and also ethical requirement that's a legal and ethical requirement comes here together because you need to uh, have uh, maintain the records for 3 years whenever the patient is asking for a record you need to give it in 72 hours so that comes as the legal part but in the ethical part it says the maleficence it is for the benefit of the patient it is for the uh, continuous support and monitoring of the patient continuous benefit of the patient that you are going to do for that so these two principles another important thing in the maleficence comes in the how much dangerous in the healthcare institution so even if it, it is a study says in the hospital setting is one of the most dangerous setting a individual can come in more than one death per thousand encounters so every thousand patient coming into an hospital there is a major complication is getting into the patient irrespective of their disease they are genuine they are normal they are perfect but just because they are entering into the hospital and they are getting and there was a comparison chart was put and even if the uh, aircraft uh, if you see probability of the aircraft treachery 1 lakh uh, uh, people uh, traveling there is a possibility of injury when you are driving it is nearly 10000 1 lakh when even if you are coming out uh, climbing and jumping down all that has a more than 10000 but has health hospital healthcare is a thousand people coming into the healthcare every thousand people the incidents are increasing so that is a there is a big study was put uh, it says in a hospital medical error kill nearly 98000 american people each year there is a huge amount this is what the maleficent talks about do no harm because he is a good individual it's a healthy individual who is coming to that legally you will be punished when there is something happen but more than legal even if you are not making your hospital surrounding a healthy patient safety oriented one and you are ethically wrong but uh, few just few examples in the, how many of our hospitals has the patient has a, uh, all our wheelchair has a safety belt and there are a lot of uh, most common uh, encounters or the or the most common the health hazards is by the falling down how you are going to prevent our falling down and if your patient is coming to you and he is falls and get into an injury that we are responsible for that prime one no serum whatever is the action you are doing it should be uh, less harmful to that how many of us are having our hospital chairs wheelchair has uh, the a safety belt our uh, bed has safety belt our uh, floor is kept clean and mopped when whether we are doing our toilets has uh, uh, a crab bar when they are physically enabled people are coming they are able to get into the toilet bar so if you are not doing this in our hospital and if you are not making it though legally also we are punishable but ethically we comes under the mal efficiency principle that we are not uh, preventing the risk of that second most common infection is a healthcare associated infection 
there are there, they are uh, if you are a hospital if you are uh, 5 percentage of people admitted into the hospitals are getting an hospital acquired infection if there is a 100 percent is admitted in your hospital five of them will your get a hospital healthcare infection because we are not maintaining the uh, surroundings clean we are not maintaining our hands clean we are not maintaining the our materials which are using uh, in the properly autoclave as uh, this again an ethical principle which come into effect to the mall efficient do no harm he has come for a surgery he has come for a, uh, an operative procedure you might have done a, a good uh, bypass uh, the cardiac bypass but is the wound infection is coming up it is going to extend his stay going to uh, have a huge money monetary loss is going to be happen for that and uh, the the amount of money which has been lost more than uh, uh, the people are dying with the hospital acquired infection is somewhere around 1 lakh people in usa are dying and the expense which we are having in uh, billions of money is wasted because of the healthcare associated infection so all these are comes under the ethical principles of uh, this another major thing is a new invasive procedures like things what we are doing is a laparoscopy surgery or a robotic surgery coming it is a learning curve yeah, any new procedure when a surgeon is going to operate and he needs to undergo a learning curve when you are going to a learning curve and you are going to cause more trouble and who is responsible you are not competent but you are under the process of learning you are getting training can you make a human being to undergo that and to make them as a guinea pig and you operate on that and we do not have a, a especially in a newer procedure we do not have the fourth principle is a justice that is fairness and equality and equity there is a difference between equality and equity and this is a one picture which talks about the equality equity and justice so this is uh, equality is this uh, is the first picture if you see there is a, some match is going on the people want to see there's a three different type of people one is a tall man one is a, a middle average and another is a very short people and you have put is a equality you have put for all three an equal height of the table uh, a, a, a footstool so that they can stand upon that and see that is only equality that is not going to be of any beneficial because the footstools of size which is not enough for the, so, the, the smallest person to see that what you talk about equity you make adjustments so everyone is in a position to see that is uh, you 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 have a, a barrier and through the barrier uh, the people are seeing that is equity and but you are putting some adjustment there is the first person is not having a stool and the, the last one is having a two stools and they able to see but justice is something more than that it is without barrier without something it's hidden and everyone gets the equal opportunity irrespective of your right irrespective of that it is not that you are empowering them it is not that you are providing them so this opportunity like what we have said earlier the person with a physically disabled coming to an hospital to prevent an uh, fall that you are producing uh, the crab bar and the anti skid floor so all this we are putting the justice to say that that everybody is going to get so that is going to be also a yeah, big problems in the uh, so, so these are the four cardinal principles of autonomy i i am repeating that because that is my my objective today that uh, you shall uh, repeatedly hear these words in whatever action you do whatever the procedure you are going to do autonomy beneficence maleficence and the justice should be prevent there are peculiar situation of the surgical when you are operating on a patient there are few issues which you are going to get as a, a, a ethical concern in a, in a operating room theater and some of the procedures do that one is getting an informed consent for your procedure i have slightly explained in the earlier part how much the we are going to tell and in what atmosphere you are going to get the concern or in a hurry or you are forcing him and making sure that everyone follow the same shape or you are making it the tailor made taking enough time to talk with the patient and explaining the situation to him and making him to take uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, decisions on his own and getting a concern of the disorder i just show you a small incident so normally this is a this is a style with which we get the concern so and even if he is asking some question and uh, the the stopness will not answer but only forcing him to do many times our patients are made to sign the our concern without getting any clarification from that and uh, by principle it is a surgeon operating surgeon must talk with the person 
of us with the patient and get the consent. It is not the junior most staff. It is the staff who is the senior most or the, the consent surgeon who is going to need to get that done. And few challenges we get an ethical exposure of the body, the dress which you are giving, number of people inside the theater, the noise we make, the comments we make in the hospital, the honesty with which we are telling this, all these are also important for that. Exposure of the body, are we only exposing adequately? The previous statement, when we are, a, as a teacher, when we teach the student, we say, whenever you are examining a case with a lipoma in the thigh, you, you undress from the uh, umbilicus to the uh, the mid thigh or the, uh, the lower part of the chest, nipple uh, uh, to the nipple. And this is a dictum the previous week. And we, we thought that it is uh, safe. You will remove the dress and that will be used uh, undress the dress. It should not be. We should never do that. It should be. We, we only uh, facilitate the patient to uh, uh, expand or uh, I mean, uh, put you to examine the body. And there is no need to completely undress the patient to uh, examine the patient. And if the patient is coming for any procedures, uh, if when you are operating on a female patient, probably you are operating on a, uh, a hysterectomy on a fever patient, you are going to put the patient on a lithotomy position. Are we able to sensitive enough to put a board outside? It's a female patient. Do not walk inside. Do not come inside. Or restrict the patients who are going to there. See how difficult it will be for the patient to put in a, a lithotomy position. And so much of people are surrounding it and making a comment on that. And when we are sending a people for... Uh, uh, small surgery in the knee joint or small surgery in the in the thigh. We ask the patient to undress, even remove the uh, underwears, panties. And what is the need for uh, removing the panties when you are going to operate on a patient for a, on, a, on the neck thyroid surgery? And this is becoming a routinely in all the public health, public hospitals or medical colleges where the, the somebody comes in the night and put a uh, he he make everything remove the patient and uh, make the patient to come. And we need to be sensitive on that because patient has a, a mind. He is an individual. He is a human. He needs dignity. He needs an honesty. There is no need to remove all that. You can pure provide a sterile, a new dress for them, new one. But the dignity, and this is the one picture uh, which we see many times when the patient is moving to the ICU. And it was a beautifully put, ICU. Uh, I'm able to see. That is what, when the patient is transferred to the ICU, most of the time, it will not cover his body. When he is going for an X-ray, going for an uh, operation theater, uh, most of the part will be get exposed. And this is, we need to be sensitive enough. There is nothing, law is not going to punish you unless they go to the court. But ethically, when we are thinking of that, it is, is it beneficial to the patient? Is it gives an autonomy or dignity of the patient is maintained? And that is more important. Too many people in the theater, and maybe in the medical college, a lot of students are coming, a lot of technicians are coming, or even the, the, the uh, hundreds of, I mean, uh, 10, 20 people are there and they are operating. That's the olden days it was done like that because there is no proper uh, sterility, no proper sense on the substance was there. But now again, if you are putting too many people and that is going to be a, a big problem and uh, uh, behavior of the people when you are transferring the patient, when you are shifting the patient, what way of comments we are making, what way of noise we are creating, what kind of jokes we are making. Remember, many times uh, the jokes are created even when the people are under the spinal anesthesia. A person under the spinal anesthesia, a person under the a, a minor anesthesia, always they can uh, hear your voice, hear your word. And he is uh, under pain and agony and tension. And when there is a doctor is creating some jokes or the funds, and uh, it will always impact the patient and his sensitivity. And the noise prevention should be there and phone call, taking a selfie, taking your photos and publishing the photos in the research articles and uh, publishing the identity of the patient in the, the publication that I have done that uh, big surgery, 7 kg uh, mass I have removed and putting that uh, name and the photo of the patient. How ridiculous it is. So we need to be sensitive enough to the dignity as a human being of the patient. So uh, keeping the uh, dress, how much clean we are making, how much we are exposing, how much people are there? Are we sensitive enough when we are operating on a female patient? Are we able to make our hospital and the theater a, a genuine, like a temple? And it is a sect of sanctorium and where we need to make all the all the things, not making it is a fun or making a comments or should be there. And even in the research, publishing the papers 
and our standard has to be maintained. So all these are very, very important thing for to make at the, the issue. Another important issue with the surgery is innovation. As we told earlier about the uh, laparoscopy surgery and things and how we are going to uh, make it there. Then uh, now there is, it is an off plate. It has become a fashion that uh, many associations are running two days course, three days course on a particular procedure and they are embarked to go and operate on a patient. Your laparoscopy training is given for three days and uh, he will now become a laparoscopy surgeon. Endoscopy is given for two days and you give a certificate and you are sending the patient and saying that, that he is competent enough to do that. Who has the power to credential these people? Do we have a system? Do we have an ethical concern? Do we have a, a pattern? And when we are going to do that, mentoring him, being with him, proctatorship with him and uh, guiding him and uh, allowing the patient to become the hand-holding. And that is not happening in India. The all Western countries, they have a very, very, very credential systems to how to credentialing a patient, how to credentialing a doctor for doing a particular procedure. And 50 laparoscopy surgery, he must be uh, done with the proctatorship. Another 50 should be monitored. Then only he will be allowed to do a laparoscopy surgery. So similar kind of setup we need to get. And also the indications. And when you are making an indication, do we have an uh, ethical standard in saying that ethical? Now, what, what is happening is a robotic surgery. Robotic surgery is coming in. The equipment itself is causing in crores. And when a particular hospital is getting an equipment, and uh, even for us, robotic surgery, robotic equipments are brought in when you are going to do operate on a, a difficult case where the procedure is inaccessible for a hand, especially for a, a trans prostatic, I mean, not a, the, the uh, a radical prostatectomy for a prostatic cancer, which was very difficult in open surgery, which but uh, uh, robotic instruments were able to do a uh, much better. But now what has happened? Even for a small procedures, ovarian cyst, hernia, or even if it is for a lipoma removal, the robotics are started used because the hospital is having a robotic. So indications for a surgery is expanded to include and accommodate the business motive or instrumentation motive of that. This is again an ethical concern which we are facing today in a corporatization of, of hospitals are coming out, newer hospitals are coming out, advertisements are going out, and now, now something like that. No pain, come and do a laser surgery. And just because you are having a laser, and all the procedures are being done in the laser without, without any scientific evidence, there's advertisements are for, for expanding the, lap, the indications, we, we need to do that. When you do a laparoscopy surgery, and we always say conversion is the important thing, and I start the I mean, laparoscopy surgery for a lap I mean, cholecystectomy. If I found it difficult, if in the first 30 minutes, and if you are not able to uh, delineate the field and the safety triangle, always it is a teaching on olden days that you convert, make it an open surgery, because our concern is beneficence for the patient. We should never do harm just in the name of that. But today, conversion is considered as a failure of a surgery. It is it is related to the, the, the surgeon, but not related to the outcome of the patient. And most of the time, may, at the end, we may say the operation is successful, but the patient is not there. So that kind of uh, yeah, yeah, concept which we need to do. The marketing which is coming in the force is very high, and many times we are going to do down. Another important thing is a disclosure, and we are going to the dilemma in this uh, ethical concern. How, how often we are saying we do some procedure in the theater, how often we are telling the, the uh, actual happening into that and vulnerable people when they are coming to us and uh, very we know the uh, uh, very recent judgments where when we are operating on the patient without getting the consent properly on the table when the doctor uh, they, uh, found out he needs to undergo a hysterectomy without getting the consent the surgeon has done the hysterectomy it was it was a big case which has filed the case so without the vulnerable people we should not do there are a lot of ethical dilemmas you get Though you have these four principles, as I told you earlier, as the ethical principles are not very clear, that is the right and left or black and white, and we get a problem. And uh, uh, when you know, when you when you come to a life-sustaining therapy, you, you are coming a patient with a very sick patient is in the ICU, and you know for sure uh, whatever the amount of uh, ventilation, whatever the amount of uh, your uh, extra support like uh, ECMO or is not going to be uh, helpful, and it's a very poor patient. And uh, how you are going to decide? And will you say that 
this is the scientific knowledge this is not going to help uh, i am going to remove equally it is important that is uh, another thing comes sometimes the patients will be into the ventilator and he is not responding and uh, they the, they will say uh, please uh, keep the patient uh, for some more life section therapy because family demands they may say that uh, the the my my uh, doctor is coming from usa so please put the patient on a ventilator for three more days till the lady comes from the uh, north i mean america or us please keep him alive put him on a ventilator so these are the the conflict area one is you know for sure that it is uh, it is not going to be beneficial the patient is also not the relatives are not so not aware but for uh, for some other motives you are sustaining and continuing the ventilator therapy or the the resuscitation therapy for more days you may get a benefit or sometimes when we you are going to say that this bed this is not going to be beneficial but the relatives are going to pressurize upon you so my my relatives are going to come you do so this is a one big dilemma we we do i am not going to the much details of that and uh, when when the patient comes for some kkk syndrome we say that is kai kal podachal or just body pain something like that and or we uh, uh, telling them truth that this is not going to be a major issue and you need not worry or we are going to give some placebo we are going to give some uh, investigation for that and this is a big ethical concern when you are writing a placebo i have seen uh, certain prescription people have vitamin c bct fst calcium all that you will add as a placebo is it justifiable ethically you may be right saying that it is giving but the patient is going to take that tablet with the belief in the doctor that my doctor will not do harm to me but if you are acting against that and if you are saying it is just for the sake of the patient you are writing a placebo and you are you are you are violating the ethical principle and if you are going to say so if the if the patient is uh, uh, when the patient is in a severe pain suffering from the oncological or the cancer suffering and when he is going to come and ask you for a morphine or he is going to act for the pain relief and whether you are going to respond to his need or you say that no by giving this drug you may get uh, addicted to drug so i have withholding drug both way you, you you can justify your stand but this is another ethical dilemma and you need to you get get into that and when the patient is uh, coming in a terminal stage 4 or the terminal illness of a cancer will you able to tell to the patient that you are suffering from this cancer and it is incurable or you will say to the patient that no uh, i can do something and uh, this is god is great and all that uh, 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 in encouraging words you are going to tell there is no clarity but ethically this is a big dilemma you need to you to get and how you are going to get uh, suppose you are doing some mistake and uh, when the mistake is not going to have a big harm for example in the theater you are make a cut unnecessary cut if the scar is extending and are we going to come back and tell what has exactly happened and this has uh, happened or are we going to cover it up no nothing harm has happened so i will not tell and this is again in another ethical uh, ethical dilemma which we will be getting that cover up we are talking about non disclosure of the error when the patient comes and asks you for a insurance setup the surgery has to be done and insurance if there may be a insurance claim which says if he is an alcoholic this is not permissible but you when you are filling up the form you may you will write no no alcoholic so you know for sure that he is an alcoholic and this injury has happened because of this alcohol or this trauma but when we are writing the hospital similarly when we are putting the rate and there are a lot of studies has proved that the the hospital rate and the insurance rate there is a lot of difference on that and how we are going to take into the that. and most importantly and uh, how we often discuss the issue of the patient with our own relatives with us with our group with our house and uh, one of our leader in uh, indian medical association used to say never ever discuss about the patient's uh, details with your own wife or with your own uh, husband because this is a, this is a, a secret secrecy which has been imparted on you and we need to maintain the secrecy and how best we are going to do that and how often we are going to get the uh, gifts from the pharmaceutical now the pharmacy act has come very very uh, the the uh, revised guidelines has come and we cannot get any benefit any gift from that but to the consciously how we are we saying is it because of the law we are avoiding this or is it to our conscious is it our ethical principle is it our uh, value that we say i will not get any promotional gift any promotional uh, incentives for because 
I do not want my decisions to be based on these promotional incentives, and then I will be taking a only an ethical value. And this is another ethical dilemma in which we are giving. And this is uh, uh, not going to the detail. Organ transplantation. This is the one major issue we face in the surgical problem. And there's a huge waiting list is there. Someone with uh, political or the monetary influence coming and bypassing the queue and getting for a, getting for an organ transplant. How much the surgeon will be able to have the courage to stand up and say that I will not do against the principle of justice. There are four other people are waiting for organ. But you just because you are having the money power, you are coming and getting it and getting that. Uh, and do we have that uh, guts to say uh, that to do? And referring the patient, this is again a big challenge, which is now happening in major hospitals where even if it is going to the gastroenterologist and he will get all the super specialists in that hospital or the corporate setup will come and give an opinion. You know, for sure, there's only an appendix, but a cardiologist will come and see, the oncologist will come, the respiratory physician, and all other uh, patients, when the surgeon is very confident of the diagnosis, your investigations prove, just for the sake of completion, just for the sake of uh, hospital protocol, are we giving, referring the patient to the concern? And uh, this already, already we are uh, 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 explained to that. And when, when you are working as a junior doctor and without properly examining the patient, the chief is saying that you do this procedure. But you as a junior doctor or as a, as, a, as, a, as a surgeon, you feel that this is not the right way to do or the scientific knowledge is good. And are you just budging to the uh, order of the chief, uh, chief of the unit or you will stand up and say, this is what feel and clarify with the chief, discuss with the chief and get it clarified and then do a decision. And again, uh, some of this in, in the difficulty with the general surgeon and the super specialist. As a general surgeon, you are expecting uh, some procedure to be done. A super specialist comes and says that, no, I can do all this, you can remove. Suppose a patient is coming up, a carcinoma, and uh, I mean, you may be feeling that this is patient is uh, or not able to tolerate all the procedure and the super specialist is coming and saying, no, I can remove the kidney, I can remove the spleen, I can remove the everything, we can do the radicality of the patient. And how we are going to behave. So these are a the few just I am putting as a uh, professionally, we will get uh, ethical issues. And equally, we are going to get some of the issue with regard to the uh, legal aspect. One is mainly about the, the qualification. And this is one of the big issue. And the many short term courses are without uh, unrecognized courses. We are putting the degree behind us. Because as per the, with the, the medical council code of ethics, and it is only the council recognized decrease we should put. And there are a lot of cases I can quote because you, uh, somebody who is just trained in anesthesia when he operated and the patient went for uh, a collapse and death when the case came uh, only on based on that because the, the anesthetist who was given the anesthesia was not a qualified. So the case is judged against the doctor. So this is uh, one area where we need to do that. Similarly, the council also says that we need to display our registration number Many surgeons do not do that. It has to be there in our name board. It has to be there in our prescription. It has to be named in the certificate which you are giving everywhere. Your registration number has to be there. And uh, the principle of uh, our honesty and professional competence comes, especially when you are leave, not, not very careful enough you are doing that. I'm not going to the details of this because uh, this all is, most of the time it is known to us. Um, our priority, what we are going to talk, Observe how we are sensitive to the needs, how we are going to do the professional etiquette of that uh, doing. And uh, also remember by law as a, as, a, uh, as a legal expert, one of the other area which I need to just uh, say for a few minutes is a vicarious liability. Is a surgery is always a team effort. It is not only enough that you are professionally competent, that not only enough that you are legally upright, not only right that you are ethically right, your team also has to be there the people who are going to work with you, because it is a teamwork. If your staff is not doing things properly, 
the entire uh, case were judged against you just because the they stopped. There are a lot of uh, judgments has come. Uh, doctor, surgeon cannot get an excuse for the mistake which is being done by the staff nurse. So you need to build your team in a proper way, uh, in, a, in a setup which we, we need to say that we are doing it in a, in a way. And similarly, when we are doing an investigation, how how effectively we are doing the investigation. These are the legal concerns. These are not the mainly ethical concerns. Legally, and if the surgeon is not doing adequate investigation, you are going to do that. How much you can charge, and if your infrastructure with which you are operating, if your infrastructure is not sufficient enough, you can be punished. If the blood transmission you are not doing with proper uh, guidelines and proper checking, you can be punished. And how much fees you can charge? There is a Justice uh, Balakrishnan and the judgment has come. There is no no uh, restriction on the charge. We are operating fee. As a surgeon, you are competent enough to charge adequately. But when you are charging for your materials, when you are charging for your uh, cost of the consumables, then you are having your problems for that. So all this, just to put that, we need to be extremely cautious on that, our 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 uh, procedure with the patient, which we do in information. Uh, friends, it is, uh, uh, I just, I'm not going to the details of the legal because I know because I don't wanted to talk more on the ethical concern, but good ethics is always a good business. And when you want to be a good surgeon, when you want to make a good earning, ethics is not going to harm you. Ethics is going to be a good business. And just because you are not caught, just because you are not, uh, so far you are not getting to problem, that doesn't mean that you are doing right. Be careful about that. Yet provides for one, to enough to satisfy all, but not the greed. There is no right way to do anything wrong. And this is one statement which we need to be extremely cautious. The time is always right to do what is right. And this is what Martin Luther King said. Though uh, um, probably uh, we have not given much importance to autonomy, beneficence, maleficent, justice. Let us learn, and that is the most important thing, when you are giving priority to that, when you are giving, following that in your law, though the legal things come into effect only when you are doing a mistake, but ethical, even if you thought of a mistake, that is going to make, may not be today, but in the future, definitely it is going to affect us. So let us take uh, a proper sense to take uh, ethics into a proper way so that we will be able to uh, do uh, something good to the uh, society, something good to the community in which we are practicing, because adopting to a safety uh, uh, required ethical way, it tells about your values, tells about your integrity, tells about your philosophy, tells about the brought up and the principles with which you are living. And the surgeon also needs to be a good human being. And we need to establish that we are good human beings so that that will be radiating to the patients whom we are operating and they will get the ultimate very good part. Thank you very much for, for patient hearing. Uh, if there is any questions on the legal, uh, and particularly we'll be able to talk on that because I, I just wanted to talk more on ethics because there is one area which often we, we neglect. Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. So you have co covered all the areas. So still, we do have some question if you like to take that up. Yeah, please. Sure, sir. So, so the first question is, what are the implications of disclosing potential risk and complication associated with invasive surgeries to patients, particularly when balancing the need for transparency with the risk of causing undue anxiety? Yeah, this is absolutely so when, when we know the, uh, the principles. First of all, the decisions to undergo the invasive procedure should be taken by the patient, not by the doctor. Doctor should not coerce, doctor should not influence, doctor should not make sure that our hospital is having the instruments so you undergo the, it should be the decision of the patient. You should take the aim over the patient. Second, you should check, are you competent enough to do the procedure? It is not the, I can do the surgery, but it is uh, the more, whether it is going to be a beneficial to the patient. If, yes, technically you can do the surgery, but if it is not going to be beneficial, definitely you should not take the Third, and all invasive procedures needs a learning curve. And a learning curve is a period where you should never attempt to do a procedure, but you must always have someone else to proctor you or monitor you or handhold you. And do you have that facility for that? The fourth one, most importantly, whenever you are invasive surgery, it is an art. It is not a pure science. 
something can go wrong. If you give a general anesthesia, patient may not be able to recover. If you give a surgery, it may be bleed profusely. But do you have a facilities or backup in the case of eventuality to support the patient or support you? So you must make sure that you have the backup in case of eventuality that you have adequate resource material and uh, resuscitation material so that that so infrastructure and the preventing aspect finally again most importantly hospital is the most most hazardous area so any invasive procedure you are doing you make sure your surrounding your built environment your infrastructure your manpower are all adequately monitored and set. that is why we make a safety checklist in the who has enlisted the safety checklist before putting the patient to the surgery there is a, a protocol of safety checklist like what we see in the flight every time we fly in the airport there's a uh, the air hostess comes and says uh, the safety procedure and uh, maybe you are the 100 times you are flying but every time it will be repeated the same word same sentence so that it, it has well proved this safety checklist in the air uh, plane has reduced the air assault. So similarly, the, if you have a, a systematic system-based protocol of safety checklist, the complications and the legal problems you can avoid. Thank you, sir. The next question is, what are the ethical considerations regarding the allocation of limited healthcare resources, including operation room time and surgical expertise in the context of ins invasive surgery? Yeah, it is, it is a very, very uh, challenging one, especially in the time of the COVID. Uh, we face this in a major issue. When the patient, a lot of people are coming for uh, ICU beds. There is no beds. We know that a lot of people were waiting outside. They were So here, we, we need to have, again, it cannot be decided by an individual. When you are going to decide by an individual, there is a possibility of biases there. So all ethical dilemmas are ethical concern. The value, the, the solution is hospital will have an ethical board which contains the non-partition non, -part non -partition people or the uh, senior people. So the issue should be brought to the knowledge of the people and they will discuss the pros and cons. They will see in a 360 degree view and they will come out of the solution. So in a case of difficult of allocation of the resources, when there's a difficulty arises, uh, the surgeon should not take the decision it should be a, a ethical board or the uh, a board of the ethical concern which is held in the hospital should take measures. Or even if the ethical board cannot take a decision. Suppose a patient, I told you earlier, a patient with the with the pregnancy of the higher order is coming or uh, some other uh, reason coming, you can go to the next level, whether the medical college or even go to the court. So it should not be a, a single-handedly decided. Ethical decision should be taken by a a collective decision of the collective consciousness of the board of the people should be taken a decision. So there is one last question. How do you navigate conflicts between patient autonomy and the physician duty to act in the patient best interest when considering invasive surgeries? Yeah, this, this is a, definitely it is a, a typical area because when we give importance to the patient welfare as the primary concern and we believe on the autonomic principle of the patient as the first concern and uh, naturally we will not take a decision with the other business pressure or the uh, marketing pressure we will only take a decision for the benefit of the patient so whenever you are taking a decision for the benefit of the patient and when we are, we are taking that it is not going to make a harm and you are always justified on that when, when there is a uh, difficulty of that, when you are taking a decision, uh, you have a robotic surgery to operate on a uh, small hernia. Another surgery, open surgery can be done for hernia, which costs 25,000. Robotic surgery, 2 lakhs. It is minimum expenditure it will cost. And if you are, a surgeon is going towards taking a robotic surgery, okay, definitely you are uh, bypassing the ethical principle. Or you must be explained to the patient if he is well enough, he has a lot of money, he is not going to hurt him. And if he persistently insists on that, he must undergo, even after the doctor is saying that both are equal, outcome of the both the procedures are equal. If the patient is choosing for a robotic surgery, nothing wrong in that. But it should not be the decision imposed by you 
that is no no i am having a robotic mission so it is better you undergo i will do much better you will, that that exaggerated claim exaggerated result should not be projected you present the fact make the patient take a decision and definitely we will be able to uh, navigate to that difficult situation thank you so much sir for answering all our questions and it's been a wonderful session with you sir and before concluding sir any last remark from you yeah uh, thank you very much for this opportunity i must thank igcp for a wonderful uh, work we are doing we always in ima i am i am talking this from uh, ima headquarters uh, media room we always remember this is the place dr k k agarwal as a secretary general has uh, lived and uh, instilled the uh, greater academic input to all of us so we all are very proud of uh, dr k k agarwal and his contribution of this igcp so on behalf of indian medical association i thank the uh, uh, the continuation of this legacy of uh, kk agarwal sir and ijcp for this wonderful work we are always indebted to him and we will always be uh, be part of this uh, program to so that the people will get the updated knowledge and skill thank you very much thank you so much sir for joining us today and with your permission sir i would like to conclude this session thank you